Well, grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So, this is session three of our four-part series on devotion, on devotional life. Pastor Paul has brought you the previous two. Next week, we'll be in person as we do our prayer walk together. But today, today in this study, we're going to be talking about prayer. Prayer in the devotion life. Or, another way you could title it is, Lord, I've got something to say. What have you got to say? What have you got to say to God? What have you got to tell God? It's weird. We've got all these, all these things that go around our head. Uh, this last week in the sermon, I talked a lot about all the, all the plates that you have spinning, everything that you've got going on in your life, how busy we are so much of the time, how, how many concerns we have on our minds, how much, how much we're doing, how much we're thinking, how much is going on with not only us, but the, those we love, those that we care about with the world, with the creation that God's made. We've got all these things going around in our heads. And the quickest way to get a bunch of Lutherans to be quiet is say, who's got a prayer request? And the room goes silent. Why are we afraid to pray? Why are we, afraid, are we just afraid to pray out loud? Do we think that people will think that we're whining, that we're complaining too much? As good Americans, we should just suck it up, buttercup. Deal with, deal with what the world gives you. When the world gives you a lemon, lemon, just make lemonade. Well, sometimes it doesn't give us lemons. It gives us rocks and sticks and stones. Those are things we should pray about, the things we should share. So first thing I want you to do, you all have your devotion sheet. First thing I want you to do, I want you to pause the video and I want you to write down five, six, handful of prayer requests. Put them on the back. Just things that are going through your mind right now. Things that are, you're struggling with. Things that you're thinking about. Things that you're thankful for. All, who knows? Just write down five or six prayer requests. Give you a minute to do that. Okay, you've got your five or six prayer requests. Put those aside for now. We'll get into what is prayer. But first, since this is a devotion, a study on prayer, oh, well, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for just all the amazing ways that you take care of your creation. The sunshine, the rain, the snow, even the sleet and the hail, Lord, we know it's all part of our all part of your will, works and ways. Lord, we thank you for for the summer, for the ability to, to play outside and enjoy that creation. We thank you for the fall that's coming. We thank you for this church, for all the all who give their time here to make this ministry happen, for those in the school, for the school families, for the church families. Lord, there's so many things that are on our mind to thank you for. There's so many things on our mind to ask you for. For those who are sick, those who are hurting, those who are grieving a lost loved one. Lord, we know we don't deserve any of what we ask for. We know we don't deserve any that we are thankful for. We know it is all a gift from you. We know we've sinned and fallen short, and so, Lord, we thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, who has come to forgive our sins, to restore us in relationship back to you, our Father. We pray all this and more, more that we can't even put into words. We pray all this in your Son's name. Amen. Okay, 
So what is prayer? You know, we can, we can be fancy. And Christian prayer is, is a meditation with God at his invitation through the mediation of Jesus Christ. It's a conversation is all. It's a conversation talking to, talking to God our Father. He asks us to talk to him. He commands us to talk to him. Pray unceasingly, as Paul says. It's a command. But is it a law? Is it gospel? It's a little bit of both. What it is not, and I think we all know this, but let's just say it so that we get it out there. What it is not, prayer is not a spiritual ATM. It's not going into your spiritual bank account and making a withdrawal of funds. Dear Lord Jesus, I need a new car. Dear Lord Jesus, I need a new job. Dear Lord Jesus, get me a new house. It doesn't work that way. It's not a magic box where we can pull out and make our requests and, and pull out our selection. Prayer does not manipulate or force God to give us what we want. God is an omniscient Father, and He will give us what He knows we need. Like Luther says so much of the time in the Catechism, we pray it even though we know our Father already knows that we need it, our daily bread, forgiveness of sins, that kind of stuff. But we pray it so that we can, we can vocalize it, so that we can be in communication with our Father. He wants us to be in communication with Him. It's a lot like your own kids or, or your own parents or your own loved ones. You don't need to talk to them. In fact, your parents probably gave you food without you even asking for it. They knew you needed it. You probably did the same thing with your kids. They, they might not even ask for lunch, but you made them lunch anyways because you knew they needed it. But it's nice to get a thank you. It's nice to give a thank you. You don't need to tell your loved ones you love them. You don't need to hear from your loved ones that you lo they love you. But it's nice to hear, and it's nice to say. Another part of prayer. Faith. Faith. Faith in the guy that you're praying to. You don't have faith in the guy you're praying to. Who are you praying to? Who are you talking to? You have to have a theological understanding. That's what faith is, an understanding of who God is. Reading through Scripture to find out who this God of ours is. Otherwise, who are you talking to? I use the analogy of a marriage a lot. Right? You love your spouse, your husband, your wife, whatever. But say you love your spouse and you say you love your spouse, but you don't know their favorite color or what their birthday is, or how they like their coffee served, or, or what, they, what they want on their birthday, what, what kind of TV shows or books they like, what their, what their likes or dislikes. You don't know your spouse, but you love them. That's, I mean, how weird would that be? No, in order to say we love God, in order to talk to God, let's, let's know who He is. Are we ever going to know him perfectly? No, of course not. There's, there's a whole hidden aspect of God that we won't know, but let's learn him as best we can so that as we talk to him, we know who we're talking to. We're having a conversation with the one true living God. We don't believe that, then our prayers are meaningless. Who are we praying to? In fact, if we don't believe that, if we don't believe we're praying to the one true living God, and if we don't know who this God is, then we're making up our own God in our minds and praying to that. And what's that called? That's called idol worship. When you make up your own God and pray to it. Know who the God is. Know who He said He is. Know who His Son is. Pray to Him. Because as Paul says, Romans 10, 14, how, how then can they call on the one they have not believed in? How do we call on a guy that we don't believe in? what Paul's saying. Prayer is a gift. It's a gift to talk to our Creator. The guy who made us. The guy who put us together. The divine, the divine presence. 
It's a tool, a tool at our disposal to talk to him, to express our love, our thanks, our admiration, our supplications, our, our prayer requests, our concerns, to confess our sins, to receive that forgiveness. That's what prayer is. So, ask a straightforward question then with prayer. In our prayers, can we go straight to God? Well, what do you think? In our prayers, can we go straight to God? I'll give you a minute to discuss. Okay, what do you think? In our prayers, do we, can we go straight to God? Many say, yes. We can go straight to God. God. God is our Father. If you can't go to your Father, then, I mean, what kind of relationship do you have? So, yes, we should be able to go to, directly towards Him in prayer. Well, kind of. 1 Timothy 2, 5 through 6. That's loud. Let's turn that down. 1 Timothy 2, 5 through 6. There is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. This has now been witnessed to you at the proper time. Mediator. Jesus Christ came to be our mediator. And what's a mediator? One who brings two or more persons together representing each party to the other. Christ is our mediator to the Father. So do, can we go straight to God? Well, I don't know. But we did have Christ who said He'd come as our mediator to bring us to God. So whether we can or not, I'm going to go through Christ. What does John 14.6 have to say? John 14.6, Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Well, that clears a little bit more up. I can't go to the Father, not directly, not by myself. I have to go through Jesus Christ. As sinners, we're unable to go unto the throne of God. I mean, think about it. Uh, Elijah, Ezekiel, um, Moses, any of them who came face to face with God the Father, and they were terrified and they dropped to their knees. The, uh, the apostles in the New Testament, when they, when they realized who Jesus Christ was, when they were at the mountain of transfiguration, Peter, James, and John, and they dropped to their knees and did the ostrich and buried their hand, head in the sand, were unworthy to be in His presence. But through Jesus Christ, covered in His sinlessness, we can then go into the presence of God. So yes, can we go to the presence of God? I'm not sure I'd want to. I need to go through Jesus Christ. What about Hebrews 4, 14 through 16? Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. We do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. We've talked about this in other studies, but what's a priest do? A priest represents the people to God bringing the sacrifices of the people to God, those atoning sacrifices. Only now, in Christ's case, He Himself is the atoning sacrifice. That, that, that bringing, bringing us before God and, and, and cleansing us of our sins so that we can stand before Him again. We need to go through Christ. 
In John 16, 23, In that day you will no longer ask me anything. Very truly, I tell you, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. You notice how we end all of our prayers in the church? How maybe you were taught to end your prayers as a kid? And maybe it's just become so rote and so this is just the way we do things. You don't think about it anymore. At least I didn't for a long, long time. We go to our Father, our Father who art in heaven. Dear Heavenly Father, dearest Lord, however you begin your prayers, but how do we end the prayers? In the name of, for the sake of, in the name of Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you, one in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. It's always in the name of Jesus. We're going through our mediator. We end our prayers in the name of Jesus, for Christ's sake. We're going through mediator, and half the time we don't even realize it. So can we go straight to God with our prayers? No one comes to the Father except through me. Can we go straight to Jesus so that He can bring our prayers to the Father? Absolutely. That's the way we do it. Okay, so this brings up an interesting question. For those of you who maybe have Catholic friends, Catholic family, or grew up in the Catholic Church yourself, if Jesus Christ is our one and only mediator, where do these saints come in? The patron saints patron saints of fishing. I think Peter's the patron saint of fishing. The patron saint of mountain climbers. The patron saint of elementary school teachers. The patron saint of whatever. I don't know all the patron saints, but there's a lot of them. Roman Catholic teaching, the patron saints are Roman Catholic teaching that some of the saints have a particular interest in certain occupations or states in life. And they often go to these saints in prayer for that particular task, figuring they know about it, they're, they're connected to it, and then they take those prayers on to Jesus who takes them on to God. I think that's the way it goes. Don't quote me, I'm not Catholic. But it goes beyond, let's, let's see here, it goes beyond the biblical mandate when we start to pray directly to those either dead or alive to ask them to intercede for us. That intercession is the role of Christ Jesus and no one else. Departed saints are no better positioned to allow us to approach God, approach the throne of God than we are now. We both are allowed to approach the throne only through the grace and mercy of Christ. Okay, so, praying to saints. The Catholic tradition says that they pray to the saints so the saint can take the prayer on to God. Where does that come from? That's not scripture. Are we to pray for each other? Absolutely. We'll get in that next. But Christ is our one and only mediator. That's the only one we pray to. Pray through, I should say. He promised to be our one and only mediator. I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is the high priest who allows us to approach God's throne in confidence. Go straight to Jesus. Now, am I saying absolutely, positively, praying to these saints does absolutely no good? You know, I can't say that. It goes beyond Scripture. Scripture doesn't tell us that. But what Scripture does tell us is it tells us that we go straight to Jesus, and Jesus takes our prayers to God. And so, I'm not sure why I should insert a middleman when I can go straight to Christ. But you say, Pastor, we pray for each other, and you're absolutely right. We'll put some of these verses on the screen for you guys to follow along. But 1 Thessalonians 5.11 Therefore encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. So Paul tells us, or tells the Thessalonians, that yes, we are to pray for each other, are supposed to build each other up. James 5.16 says, is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. 
Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. I love that. The prayer of the righteous person is powerful and effective. Ephesians 6, 8. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayer and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. 2 Corinthians 1, 10 through 11. He has delivered us from such a deadly peril that he will deliver us again. On him we have set our hope that he will continue to del deliver us. As you help us by your prayers, then many will give thanks on our behalf for the gracious favor granted us in answer to the prayers of many. Philippians 1, 19. For I know that through your prayers and God's provisions in the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. 1 John 5, 16. If you see any brother or sister commit a sin that does not lead to death, you should pray and God will give them life. I refer to those whose sin did not lead to death. There is a sin that leads to death. I'm not saying that you should pray about that. And that 1 John passage gets very confusing. If you'd like to talk about 1 John, I, it's one of my favorite subjects, the unforgivable sin. Come in, we'll talk about it, but that's not why we're talking here and now. The point of all these passages is what's God telling us to do? He's telling us to pray for each other. Pray for each other. Now is that... Is that getting a different mediator? No, that's just getting more people to talk about their concerns to God. So, does God tell us to pray through a patron saint? No. Does He tell us to pray through each other? Absolutely. Does He tell us to pray directly to Him through Jesus Christ? Yes. Go through Christ. Pray for each other. Stick to Scripture. Okay. So, Next thing I want to talk about with prayer. How does God answer our prayer? Why don't you talk about that for a few minutes? How does God answer our prayer? What kind of answers does He provide? Discuss. Okay, so what did you come up with? What kind of answers does God give to prayer? Well, there's the one we really like to hear. The best answer of all for most of us, yes. Yes. Matthew 7, 7 through 8. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. The one who knocks, the door will be opened. John 14, 13 through 14. And I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may glorify, be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. So God can very much answer your prayer, yes! Yes, you can get that new car. Yes, you can get that new house. Yes, you can get that promotion. Yes, she will marry you. Yes, you will have a healthy child. Yes! You will have that healthy child eventually leave the home, become a healthy, independent adult. Yes, God can answer our prayers in the affirmative, and those are great. But for all you parents out there, you understand that that's not the only answer to a child's question. Sometimes yes is not the right answer. Mom and Dad, can I eat as much sugary cereal until my, my belly pops out and my cheeks bust? No. Mom and Dad, can I watch as much TV as I want until my eyes fall out? No. Mom and Dad, can I go play in traffic? No. There are some things that we know better for our children. 
And therefore, their requests we have to deny. And does that make our children upset? Absolutely, it does. They get all sorts of furious when we tell them no. If you've ever told a two-year-old no, you know the temper tantrum that, gets, that, that proceeds from that answer. But is it best for the child to say no sometimes? Even if they throw a fit. Because gosh knows. We as adults never throw fits when we don't get what we want. Sometimes the answer is no. James 4, 3. When you ask, do not... Re when you ask, you do not receive, because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Maybe we're, maybe we're just being flat sinful in our prayers sometimes. That's a possibility. What about Matthew 26, 39? Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. If Jesus can put aside his own will for the sake of his Father, for his Father's will, where does that put us? Sometimes what I want and what God wants does not align. And I need to fix me. I can't expect God to bend his will to mine. What kind of silliness is that? I need to bend my, my will to God's. 2 Corinthians 12, 8-10 This is Paul. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to, my, said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulty. For when I am weak, then I am strong. You see, sometimes God's answer to our prayers is a flat no. Nope, whatever you're asking for ain't happening. It might be sinful, at which point, repent, come to confession and absolution. And it might just be your will and God's will at this moment in life are not aligned. And then you pray, Lord, align my will with yours. Or as Jesus said, not as I will, but as thy will. But there's one more answer. One more answer. And a lot of time we as parents use this answer as the delaying tactic. Maybe if I say maybe, or later, the child will stop asking. I don't think that's why God does it. But in 2 Peter 3, 9, The Lord is not slow in keeping His promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. The point there is God works on His own timetable. We as humans get nervous we stare at the clock in the corner of the, the computer screen. We stare at the clock at the other corner of the computer screen. We stare at the clock on the, the phone. We stare at the clock on this phone. We, a lot of us wear watches. We're surrounded by clocks. Our lives are driven by the clock. We have appointment calendars that keep us on task, on schedule, every hour, every minute, every second of the day. God doesn't work like that. He exists outside of time. Time is a creation, so He exists, therefore, out of it. And so if God exists outside of time, then His own timing is up to Him and not up to us. Lord, I really need this promotion. If I don't get this promotion in the next 30 days, my life's ruined. Maybe He doesn't want you to get that promotion in the next 30 days. Maybe He's going to give it to you in two years with much better results. Lord, she doesn't marry me. If I don't get married right now, my life's over. Well, maybe you're not supposed to marry her. Maybe you're supposed to marry that girl you're going to meet in two years. Who knows? A lot of the time God says maybe because God works on His own time, not ours. 
And so then, then, in those cases, when we're waiting for an answer and God is either silent or the answer comes to be later, then, Lord, give me patience. Lord, give me patience. Then I may wait patiently for your will to come to fruition. Whatever the will that may be. Lord, if that's your will to say yes to my prayer, so much the better. Lord, if that answer comes back at a later time, no. Lord, strengthen me in my belief so that I, I may so that you may reform my will to match your own. Another misconception about prayer or a misunderstanding about prayer. Let's tell in a story first. Two years ago when I moved here, moved to South Dakota, we drove through some really significant flooding, especially over the eastern side of the state, right along there in the Missouri River. South Dakota, Nebraska, Kansas were undergoing historic flooding. This is a fictional story, but the flooding happens. And this, this farmer's seeing the floodwaters come up, and he says, Lord, Lord, save me from the floodwaters. The floodwaters keep rising. Many of you have heard this story. If you've heard it, great. Keep going with me. Lord, save me from the floodwaters. And God, God sends out a message. And it comes out as a big siren saying, hey, there's a storm and there's a flooding coming. And the farmer says, Lord, save me. The floodwaters rise. And, and his neighbors come over and, hey, can we help sandbag around your house? He says, no, the Lord will save me. So they leave. The floodwaters rise. And they now are filling the first floor of the house. And he crawls to the second floor and he says, Lord, save me. And, and just then a, a boat comes by little rowboat and says, get in the boat. And the guy says, nope, the Lord will save me. And the waters rise some more. And he crawls up out on the roof. And he says, Lord, save me. And just then a helicopter comes. He says, jump on the, grab the ladder, jump to the, you know, we'll pull you up. And he says, no, the Lord will save me. And the flood waters rise some more. And he drowns. He goes up to heaven. He's standing at the pearly gates and he's talking to St. Peter and St. Peter ushers him in and takes him to the throne room of God. And he stands there, forgiven in Jesus Christ, and he stands there in the throne room of God. And he says, Lord, why didn't you save me? God says, well, let's turn the air raid siren on so that you know a storm was coming. Since your neighbor's over with sandbags, I sent the boat... And I sent a helicopter. What more did you want me to do? You see, like I know, many of you have already heard that story. It's kind of a cheesy story, I know. But the point is this. God gave you two hands, two arms, two legs, two feet. For the most of us, there's a few that are missing some limbs, but that's okay. He gave them mouths to speak. Gave them legs to walk or wheelchairs to move in. He gave us abilities to work within our own prayer requests. Now, don't hear what I'm not saying. You have no ability whatsoever, neither do I, nor does anyone else, in their own salvation. That's all Jesus Christ. I am a horrible, lowly and condemned sinner, and I am only saved through the blood of the innocent blood sacrifice of my Lord Jesus Christ. It's only because of Him that I can go back to my Father. However, it is not only because of Jesus Christ how I get my next job. Not that I want another job. I like this one a lot. But, your next job. It's not solely by the work of Jesus Christ that my son gets good grades in school. Right? 
Dear Lord, allow my son to get good grades in school. But then if I do hands off and I don't ask him about school, if I don't help him with his homework, if I don't if I don't drive him to school and pick him up from school, if I'm not involved and invested in his in his school life and his studies, then what kind of grades is he going to get? If you say, Lord, help me help me get this promotion, but then you're late to work and you don't show up half the time, and then the work you do do is half half baked and shoddy, you're probably not going to get that promotion. My point is, within, within the context of our own salvation, it's all Jesus Christ. Within the context of our prayer requests in the here and now, you got a role to play. Get up off the couch. Or as Luther said, all who call on God in true faith, earnestly from the heart, will certainly be heard and will receive what they have asked and desired. Although not in the hour or in the measure or in the very thing in which they ask, yet they will obtain something greater and more glorious than they had dared to ask. God doesn't always answer our prayers the way we want. God doesn't always answer them in the timing he wants, we want. God sometimes makes us work for our own prayer requests. But what Luther is saying here, as we continue to pray, we continue to work at the prayer requests that we've sent up. And what God will give is far greater than we could have ever asked for. Okay. Okay. Last part, what makes up a prayer? Well, so I started my prayer with thanksgiving. Lord, I'm pretty thankful that I'm allowed to be here. Philippians 4, 6, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. God, thanks for allowing me to be alive. Thank you for allowing me to live in your creation. Thank you for all the gifts that I don't deserve, but you give me anyways. Psalm 95, 1 through 2. Come, let us sing for the joy of the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. Ephesians 5, 19 through 20. Speak to the one speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs of the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Be thankful. Not every prayer has to be, Lord, give me, provide for me, take care of me. Those are good. We'll get to those in a second. Sometimes it's good to just say thanks. Thanks for who you are and what you've done. But, we have plenty of requests. We call those supplications. Supplications. Humble requests to God for prayer. Supplications, all the stuff we need. And that can be broken down into two categories. The spiritual supplications, Lord. You know, the, the, the uh, Father from Mark 9. Lord, I believe. Help me with my unbelief. Lord, help me grow in my knowledge of you. Help me grow in my faith and my devotion towards, towards you and my family. Help me, help me be better about reading the scriptures. Help me be better about speaking the gospel. Help me be better about living out my faith in, in a world that, that doesn't seem to like you or know you. And then there's this physical supplications. Lord, I'm sick and I don't want to be sick anymore. Lord, I've got cancer and I want the cancer to go away. Lord, I hurt, and I don't know why. And that's where we get into intercessions. Intercessions are, is nothing more than a supplication for somebody else. We're interceding on behalf of our loved ones. Oftentimes, the church prayers used to be called the intercessory prayers, our intercessions on behalf of others. Thanksgiving, supplications. Praise, thanks, 
asks. Put in repentance. Repentance. Confession can be part of prayer. All that can be part of prayer. So how do we pray? Matthew 6, 5 through 8. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their, full re their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what you have done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you even ask. Okay, Christians always have a hard time with this one. Does this mean we're always supposed to pray in secret? How does that work for church? Because we pray in a big group, in a big room. It's unlocked and anybody can come in. Oftentimes we go out. Does that mean you're not supposed to pray when you go out to eat? Does that mean you can't pray when you're out at a public function? Does that mean me as a, as a National Guard chaplain can't pray in front of a bunch of National Guard soldiers? Does that mean we're always supposed to pray alone? Matthew 18, 19 through 20. Again, truly, I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am with them. Well, if we're agreeing about things about Jesus Christ and we're gathered together, maybe we can talk to Jesus Christ while we're gathered together. Acts 2, 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship in the breaking of bread and prayer. And there's other examples we can go through. There are plenty of examples of the apostles, the disciples, praying together. They, they devoted themselves to teaching and fellowship, to breaking of bread and prayer. Yes, pray together. Pray out in public. Not for show, don't pray to, hey, look at me. No. Pray because you want to talk to your God. Pray because you want to thank Him for the meal that's in front of you. Don't do it ostentatiously. Don't do it for show. Do it because you want to talk to God and you happen to be outside. Pray, because, pray in, in the church because you happen to want to talk to God and you're with your brothers and sisters in Christ. When we're in that sanctuary, when we're praying together, bring your prayers Bring your prayer requests out. Let us know what's on your heart and mind. Let us pray together for each other so we can lean on each other, so we can be the body of Christ together. Let's pray together so that we can live together as Christ's church, as His bride. Okay, there's plenty of other stuff we could talk about prayer. Um, what do we do? Uh, do... Do we do formal prayers? Do we do informal prayers? Is it better to have written prayers? Is it better to speak from the heart? It depends on the situation. Do prayers change depend on the situation that you're in? Absolutely, they should. There's more we can talk about prayer. But I think the best way to end a discussion on prayer at least in the video portion. If you want to keep discussing in your groups afterwards, that's great. I encourage it. In fact, we've got discussion questions to go through. Let's pray the way that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. That's where Matthew ends. But we, as, as the Christian church, have added these last two lines. They have become church tradition. They have become the tradition of this prayer. So we speak them now. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. And all God's people said, Amen. What's all men mean? Yes, yes. It must be so. Okay. 
There are five discussion questions here. Go through the discussion questions at your leisure. If you don't have these, come pick this up from, pick up this half sheet from, from the church. We have it in the narthex. If you're catching this video quite late, I will gladly reprint it and remake some for you. Just come and ask me. Sit down and, and talk over these with, with your spouse, with your parents, with those in your small group. And then at the very end, when you've made your discussion, those prayer requests you put on the back, pray for each other. Pray for each other. Intercede on each other's behalf. Bringing your prayers to the one and only mediator that we have, the one and the only mediator we'll ever need. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Blessings on your discussion. Thanks for joining. God bless.